If you walk into a medieval stone hall today, stripped of furniture and left bare, the first thing you notice is how brutally cold the floor feels underfoot. That sensation has convinced generations of people that medieval life was a constant battle against freezing interiors, drafty castles, and numb toes. But the historical record tells a different story. Medieval people were not foolish, and they were not resigned to discomfort. They lived in these buildings for decades, sometimes centuries, and they developed floor systems that actively reduced heat loss, moderated moisture, and kept living spaces usable even in deep winter. The real surprise is not that they lacked carpets and heaters, but that they didn't need them in the way we assume. Floors were engineered as part of a complete thermal system, working with fire placement, wall mass, airflow, and daily habits. Once you understand how these floors worked, you start to see medieval buildings not as primitive shelters, but as carefully balanced survival machines. That's what we're breaking down today. The mistake of judging medieval floors by modern expectations. The first error modern observers make is assuming medieval floors were meant to feel warm to bare skin. That expectation didn't exist. Warmth was measured by whether a space can serve body heat over hours, not whether it felt pleasant for a few seconds. Medieval floors were designed to slow heat loss, block ground moisture, and stabilize indoor temperature rather than produce warmth directly. Stone, earth, wood, and lime were chosen deliberately because of how they stored and released heat. A floor that feels cold at first contact can still be effective if it prevents deeper heat drain from the body and the room as a whole. This distinction matters because medieval people spent most of their indoor time moving, working, or seated on raised furniture. Standing still barefoot on a floor was not part of daily life. Once you remove modern habits from the equation, medieval floor design starts to make sense. Packed earth floors were thermal buffers, not bare dirt. In early medieval homes and rural buildings, packed earth floors were common, and they were nothing like exposed soil. These floors were compacted over time with repeated wetting, tamping, and sometimes the addition of clay, ash, straw, or lime. The result was a dense surface that acted as a thermal buffer between the living space and the cold ground below. Packed earth changes temperature slowly. During the day, heat from fires, bodies and sunlight absorbed into the surface. At night, that stored warmth was released gradually. This reduced temperature swings and prevented the sharp cold shock associated with thin wooden floors or exposed stone slabs. In survival terms, this is the same principle used in modern earth-sheltered homes. You can apply this knowledge today by understanding why thin concrete slabs over bare ground feel colder than thick earthen or masonry floors. Thermal mass matters more than surface warmth. Stone floors worked because they were paired with fire and airflow. Stone floors are often blamed for medieval cold, but the issue is context. Stone was used primarily in buildings with constant fire use, thick walls, and controlled airflow. Large hearths and central fires radiated heat downward as well as outward. Stone absorbed this energy and held it long after flames died down. In castles and monasteries, floors were often laid over rubble fill or sand rather than directly on bedrock. This reduced conductive heat loss into the ground. Lime mortar joints also played a role by reducing moisture penetration, which is critical because damp stone feels colder than dry stone. A modern practical takeaway is that stone floors only become 
unbearable when they are isolated from heat sources. In medieval buildings, floors were part of the heating strategy, not separate from it. Wooden floors were raised, layered, and insulated by air. By the later medieval period, wooden floors became more common in domestic spaces, especially on the upper levels. Now, these were not thin planks nailed to joists like our modern floors. Instead, they were thick boards laid tightly together, often above an air gap or over storage spaces, livestock stalls or service rooms. Air, when it's trapped, is an effective insulator. The space beneath wooden floors slowed heat loss quite dramatically. In many houses, heat from animals below would rise through the structure, warming the living area above. This was, you know, intentional. It also reduced ground dampness, which was one of the main enemies of warmth. Survivalists can learn from this by recognising how raised sleeping platforms, bunkers and huts benefit from air gaps underneath. Elevation alone can significantly reduce heat loss. Lime-treated floors changed everything. One of the most overlooked medieval innovations is the use of lime in floors. Lime-stabilised surfaces created harder, drier, more hygienic floors that resisted moisture. Moisture is what makes cold unbearable. A dry floor at 5 degrees Celsius feels warmer than a damp floor at 10. Lime also reflects heat and light from fires, increasing the effective warmth of a room. Some medieval floors incorporated crushed ceramic, charcoal or ash into lime mixes, increasing thermal mass and durability. You can still see this principle in traditional Mediterranean homes today where lime floors regulate indoor climate without modern heating. Rushes, straw and herbs were, well, functional insulation layers. While the title focuses on floors without carpets, it's important to understand that medieval people did use these removable organic coverings. Rushes and straw weren't decoration, no, not at all. They trapped air, absorbed moisture, and reduced heat loss through the floor. These materials were replaced regularly, which kept the whole system clean and effective. This approach allowed flexibility, you see. Floors could be cleared for cleaning or special events, and then re-layered when insulation was needed again. It was really a modular thermal solution, not a sign of neglect. From a practical standpoint, this actually mirrors how modern cold-weather shelters use removable insulation layers rather than permanent fixtures. Human behaviour completed the system. Medieval warmth wasn't just about architecture, it was behavioural too. People sat on benches, stools and chests rather than directly on the floors. Beds were elevated. Footwear was worn indoors, which is interesting, isn't it? Work was done near heat sources. Rooms were used differently depending on the season and the time of day. Floors didn't need to be warm to the touch because bodies were rarely in prolonged direct contact with them. Heat loss was minimised by posture, clothing and movement. Ignoring behaviour leads to misunderstanding architecture honestly. The two evolve together. Why does this knowledge still matter today? Well, understanding medieval floor design is not about nostalgia. It's about learning how people survived cold environments with limited resources. Thermal mass, moisture control airflow and behavioural adaptation. These are still the foundation of efficient shelter design. Whether you're studying historical buildings, building an off-grid cabin or planning emergency shelters, these principles remain relevant. Medieval people solve problems that, frankly, we still face today, 
just without electricity or fossil fuels. If this breakdown added something new to how you understand medieval life, architecture or survival systems, support the channel by subscribing to Forgotten Frontlines. Share this video with anyone who still thinks medieval people just endured the cold instead of mastering it to add. Every subscription helps keep these deep historical lessons alive and explored in the detail they deserve.